The Lord is risen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Let us prepare for worship. Good morning. Good morning. 
Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to this service of worship today on the 14th of April. My name is Lee Hunter, and I am the pastoral resident here at White Memorial. And joining me in worship today is Christopher Edmondson, our pastor and head of staff, Genevieve Brooks, our director of youth ministry, um, Chip Pope, our associate pastor for family ministry, and Carl Zinsmeister and Kirsten Hamdrum, our directors of music, are going to lead our choir in music this morning. The Reverend Dr. Ted Smith is from Emory University's Candler School of Theology is preaching an on point right now, um, and he's going to and Christopher's going to preach for us in this space. But you can still hear Ted if you come to the lecture at 12:45 in Main Hall this afternoon. Just a few announcements to get us going this morning. Next, next week on April 21st at 3 p.m., I hope you can join us for a very exciting Sounds on Oberlin concert featuring the music of our, of our very own Dr. Jeff Syker, who has been working on a project to set all 150 psalms to music. Um, he will be playing just a, a few uh, selections from those psalms and will be accompanied by other White Memorial musicians. So please do join us for that next Sunday at 3 p.m. in Main Hall. Our major mission partner for 2024, South Light, is offering tours of their facility over the next few weeks. The dates and times are on the church website and in the newsletter. If you would like to see all of the great work that they are doing in this community for mental health and substance use treatment, please contact Linda Nunnally to reserve your spot. There is still time to register for a very special evening celebrating Haiti Outreach Ministries' 35th anniversary celebration. That's on Saturday, May 4th at 6 p.m. in Main Hall. Registration can be found online at the website. The evening is going to include an opening reception followed by a Haitian-themed dinner and a program of speakers including our good friend Pastor Leon um, and other Haitian friends. Our youth ministry invites you to join them on Sunday, May 5th from 5 to 7 p.m. in K200 for Soul Shop. Soul Shop for Communities is a two-hour training for adults in our congregation and our community who want to explore how we think and talk about suicide and how to prevent it. You can learn more about this program on our website. Um, this is a wonderful course that equips you to be a part of the solution, so you will not want to miss that opportunity. So now as we transition from getting here to being here, let us steady our hearts and our minds and prepare for worship. Please join me in our call to worship. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Let us worship the Lord of light.
Friends, there is nothing in heaven or on earth or under the earth that is hidden from God. God knows what is on our hearts and in our minds. God knows what our sin is. So why do we confess it out loud? We say it because it is honest and because it is true. In speaking about our sin in front of God and our neighbors, we hold ourselves and one another accountable. We claim responsibility to do better. And we say it because we are confident in God's grace and mercy. By saying it out loud, we have nothing to fear and nothing to hide. Because even though we sin, God forgives us and redeems us. So let us confess our sin together. God of light, there is much that we would prefer to remain in the shadows and hidden from view. Our selfishness, our greed, our desires for power, and our disregard of your commands. Yet we cannot remain hidden from you, for you know us completely, and you love us still. Illuminate our sin, so that we might turn away from darkness to live in the light. Forgive our resistance to follow in the ways of Christ, and help us to grow more and more in his likeness. Amen. Friends, the God who sees in secret and knows in secret is always with us. God was here in the beginning of time. God became enfleshed at a particular moment, and God is with us still. God knows us, God loves us, and God forgives us for all of the things that we have done and all of the things that we will do that go against God's desires for us and for other people. And because God has made this peace with us, we are invited to extend God's peace to our siblings in Christ, saying to one another, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Share signs of peace with one another. Friends, please be seated. Earlier this morning, members of our session met with a group of individuals who expressed a desire to join the membership of White Memorial Presbyterian Church. Um, three of them are here with us in the sanctuary, and there's another group down in the On Point service. And if I call your name in, in here, the three of you who are here with us this morning, they're going to stand up and they're going to wave at y'all, and y'all are going to wave back and say, welcome, okay? because we're going to practice an ethic of hospitality. I also will read the names of those who are joining down at On Point in case they might be an acquaintance or someone that you know from here in the community. Um, so down in On Point, Olivia and Tyler Motley are joining. Um, they have six-month-old twins, Towns and Eloise, and they join by reaffirmation of faith. Here in the sanctuary, we have Florence Watley, and Florence is going to wave, and you're going to say, Hey, Florence. Um, Florence joins by certificate of her transfer of her membership letter from another local church here in town. Welcome, Florence. Um, also here with us are Elizabeth and Jeff Barnes. And they join us here at White Memorial by the certificate of their letter of church membership from the Dover Church in Dover, Massachusetts. So welcome to you two. We're so glad you're here with us. Also down in On Point are Lisa and Dave Hermanson. Uh, they come with certificate of transfer of their church letter from the Community Presbyterian Church in Ventura, California. Uh, Sarah McBrien 
uh, joins by profession of faith. Some of you all may know her. She's one of our part-time teachers in the weekday school. In addition to being a nurse here locally three days a week, she has three children, 10, 8, and 4. Um, so Sarah is a busy person. And then finally, Jamie and Chris McAkron. Uh, Jamie joins by certificate of transfer um, from a local church here in Raleigh, and Chris joins by certificate of his letter transfer from Northminster Presbyterian Church in Hickory, North Carolina. They have two children, six and four. So if you see any of these folks, please say hi to them and welcome them to our membership. Um, our staff member, Elizabeth Viol, she's going to wave your hand. She's going to make sure that these three at least get out front so that you all can greet them this morning. And um, if you have to rush off, do. But if not, enjoy some of the beautiful weather and say hi to these folks and the folks who come up from one point. Um, welcome to White Memorial. Um, you grace us um, with your presence here with us today. Amen. It is a joyful occasion when we have the opportunity to um, celebrate the sacrament of baptism this morning. Um, in two weeks here in the sanctuary, we'll be welcoming our new class of compromands um, who have been working all year through the confirmation process. Um, and this morning, we have the opportunity to participate together in the sacrament of baptism for two of those compromands. Uh, I'm joined up front by our elder this morning, Celia Polk, um, who's Last name is not just a coincidence. <laughs> um, but I'd like to um, invite first Eleanor Weston Gotzigan, who's the daughter of Adam and Jennifer, to come forward. And also here this morning is Gavin Maddox Wright, son of Jimmy and Callie Wright. of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded with you. And remember, I am with you always, says Christ, to the end of the age. And so obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show us that we belong to God. And so by water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. And on behalf of the session, I present Eleanor Weston Gotzigan and Gavin Maddox Wright to receive the sacrament of baptism. And so, uh, Eleanor and Gavin, as you have come uh, professing your faith this morning for baptism, I ask you these questions. Putting your whole trust in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, do you desire to be baptized? Do you? In trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? And will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers? Will you? Will the congregation in the sanctuary and those viewing or listening at home or other locations please rise in body or spirit? Our Lord Jesus Christ commanded us to teach and support those who are baptized. Do you, the people and members of the church, promise to pray for and support Eleanor Weston Gotsigan and Gavin Maddox Wright? Do you? We do. You may be seated. Let us pray. Send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who cleansed it and are cleansed by it. Raise them to new life and graft them to the body of Christ. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Eleanor and Gavin as they may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. Amen. Eleanor, I'll be step forward. What is your given name? Eleanor Weston, Eleanor Weston, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are marked as Christ's own and claimed by Christ forever. Amen. What is your given name? Gavin Maddox, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are claimed by God and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. While God has loved Eleanor and Gavin since they were born, and even before, this is a wonderful opportunity um, for us to recognize that love. And in the sacrament of baptism, they are claimed by God and they are engrafted into our family of faith. And so we celebrate them becoming a part uh, of this family of faith, both here at White Memorial and the broader church together. And so Eleanor and Gavin, welcome and God bless you. Amen. I'd like to um, invite any young children who are here to join me up at the front for our scripture reading. Do we have any young children? Okay, then let's not do that. All right. <laughs> Wait a minute, we've got one. Yes. Awesome. I can't think of a better person to join me up here this morning. So, David, <laughs> Davis, do you know how many Gospels there are? Just make a number between one and ten. There's four Gospels, that's right. And a gospel is what we call a story of good news of Jesus coming to live with us on earth. We have four gospels. Yeah, exactly. So um, we have four gospels. They're named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all start a little bit differently. So today we are reading from the beginning of John, which is really different from all of the others. So listen now to the beginning of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light. <laughs> One second, Davis. <laughs> He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace 
and truth. That was quite a bit. That was a lot at the beginning of John. And it's quite a different beginning to the gospel where, we, where John is saying that Jesus was with God in the beginning of time. Do you remember in Genesis where it said that God created the heavens and the earth and everything that was in them? So John is saying that Jesus was with God in the beginning. Isn't that crazy? Super crazy. So Jesus came and lived with us. The verse says the word became flesh and lived among us. And, we, and he lived with us and then he died and was resurrected and went to be with God in heaven. And sometimes what we say is that the church is the body of Christ. So we are doing Jesus' work in the world. And the um, Eleanor and our teenagers who got baptized this morning and the folks who are joining the church are a part of the, of the body of Christ now. And they get to be a part of our community and we get to be good neighbors to them. So that is our scripture and our time together. So why don't we all pray together? Dear God, Dear God, thank you for the good news of the gospel. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. The story of Jesus. The story of Jesus. Coming to live among us. Coming to live among us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For teaching us. For teaching us. How to live our lives. How to live our lives. As your disciples. As your disciples. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Davis. Thanks, Genevieve. And thank you all. So just to clarify, you already read the John 1 to them, correct? I read the John 1, but not the 1 John. Thank you. <laughs> As you saw with people moving around, we had a medical situation down at On Point, but um, the paramedics are here, and um, I asked Chip to go down there and let me know anything. I saw Christy running that way back there in the back, so I think things are as stable down there as they can be. Um, so we pray for our brother in faith. Um, today who um, has had a very different morning than he expected, that he will um, be stable and get the care that he needs. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, so uh, the first letter of John is one of the lesser epistles, which is a terrible title in its own right, but that's what they're known as. Um, but it happens to have some of the most beautiful scripture that we find anywhere in the New Testament. Um, and it also is very reflective of the larger works of the Gospel of John. And so in the Gospel of John, um, we have heard from this morning already, we learn a lot about the nature of Jesus and how Jesus reveals something very important from God and about God to us. And so here in First John, we pick up on that theme. It says, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have seen and heard what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. These words from the first letter of John, along with the gospel according to John, are for us to stay the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, so, so I want to start today in, in a sort of a Bible nerdy place, but every now and then you need to do that. And the Bible nerdy place is to say that in the Bible we've got four gospels, and they're each distinct, and they're each unique. Uh, please note that they all say the same things about the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is absolutely in agreement. They often even tell the same stories, using the same words. So there are lots of similarities, but they each have their distinctives all at the same time. Think of it this way. If we were to hire four different artists to paint four different pictures, 
uh, paintings about the spirit of North Carolina and what it really was. You might get one that was of the beach, and you might get one that was of the mountains, and you might get one that was like agricultural land in the Piedmont, and you might get one from some great cultural celebration in North Carolina, but they would all be North Carolina. And that's sort of how the Gospels work. Mark is probably our oldest gospel. It's only got 16 chapters. It is the most direct. It tells you in the first verses that Jesus is the Son of God, and it's a hurry to get you to the end. It races towards the cross and the resurrection. Matthew is a little slower. It's pedagogical. Matthew wants to explain exactly how Jesus completes the law of God. That's why the longest section of teaching anywhere in the Bible found called the Sermon on the Mount, is found in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew is all about showing us how Jesus completes the visions of the prophets of the Old Testament. Luke is our intellectual Gospel. It uses probably the most complex Greek vocabulary, syntax, and sentence structure in all of the New Testament. And Luke also has a particular concern for outsiders, so sometimes it's called the Gospel to the Gentiles. Luke is categorically convinced that Jesus is for the whole world, and the Easter Sunday resurrection was for any person on earth. Jesus is for everyone, man or woman, who is called to follow him. And that leads us to John and the gospel which bears his name, also the name of our epistle lesson today. John sees Jesus as cosmic, not just as the fulfillment of the law, not just as the crucified and risen Lord, not just as a savior of the world, but beyond that, in John, Jesus is part of God's plan right from the beginning. Only the gospel of John begins like the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible. Jesus does suddenly appear in John. Instead, he is the word of God, the power of God, the goodness of God from the very beginning of time itself. For John, Jesus is the beginning and the end. And he had no doubt that Christ is God's gift and resolution to history, time, and space. And this testimony colors everything that Jesus does and who he is in every verse of the gospel. Jesus is cosmic and above all. Of course, we also have to note this, that also in John, and this is a little bit of an irony, but it is just as true, Jesus is also very earthy. What do I mean by earthy is that he is completely human. In spite of his cosmic nature, he is down in the trenches with men and women. He cries over the death of a friend. He fishes. He literally goes fishing with the disciples. There is nothing more earthy than going fishing. You realize your limitations. You have to deal with the bait. You're out there on the boat. If you fall in the water, you're going to get wet, and so on and so on and so on. You can't be more part of the earth than when you go fishing. He attends the wedding of a family friend. He is cosmic and eternal, very involved in the human experience. So the breathe in and breathe out earthly existence that we live every night and day. That is one of the great lessons of John. That God is invested and interested in how we live each and every day, part of our daily lives and experiences. Now at first glance, that may seem a small or trivial thing. You, you might go, well, well duh, Pastor. Of course God cares about our daily lives. But the big truth is that the first glance has the potential to deceive us because God, this very big cosmic God revealed to us through Jesus Christ, is part of our daily lives in ways that we can barely imagine. God is cosmic and God is earthly, both at the same time. And so in John's gospel, the divine and the human, that's where they intersect in beautiful ways. I think it all comes to a head at John chapter 1, verse 14, which says that the literal word of God, that is Jesus, became flesh, human flesh, and dwelt among us. That's a way that the saying that the cosmic Christ knows everything about our earthly selves. And I think that's good news. I think that's really good news. So today at White Memorial, we welcome a wonderful theologian named Ted Smith, teaches church history and theology. He's with us. He preached this morning, and he was preaching down at On Point, and he'll be with us this afternoon, as Lee announced earlier. Um, much of his work fo focuses on the evolutions of the American church over the last two to three hundred years, 
And his preaching today would have focused upon the theme, the church made flesh, which is a reminder of two things. One, that in the gospel of John, the cosmic Christ is connected to earthly things. And two, that because the church is made up of people just like you and me, the church is a manifestation of the human experience. So, like I said, he's preaching and teaching, and his focus will be on the American church experience. Namely, he's going to say to us that all of the evidence, all of the data you can find, it doesn't matter if you go to liberal sources, conservative sources, independent think tanks, universities, all the data says that across the country, from sea to shining sea, the church in America is in decline. Now, two things. One, at White Memorial, we are continuing to grow. And we do not take that for, for, for granted. Partly, this is due to Raleigh demographics, right? You've looked around here. The city is growing. How many cranes do we have? Does anyone know? It's a lot. It's a lot. But two, we've also, we've also really worked hard. I think part of it is that we are a healthy church, we have new members. We have lots of children. We have great pastoral care. We have meaningful and inspiring worship and amazing financial support because of all of you. In short, we are a good and healthy church, always with looking ways for ways to improve, but not taking our health for granted. And so we here are defying all those national trends as I preach today. But to continue to do this, we have to understand where the American church has been and where it is today and where it might be going. And that's why Ted is with us this weekend. Let's go back two to 300 years. Let's go back before the Declaration of Independence. Back then, we had a situation that Ted calls the standing orders, the standing orders of societies. Did you know that back then, pastors received their salaries from taxes that folks like y'all paid? It was no different than it was in England. This is long before separation of church and state. And so the reality was at that time in America, church membership was under 20%. Why? Because people like y'all were already paying taxes for the pastor who was required by law to do your weddings and your funerals and pray at civic gatherings. And all those things were, were things that the pastors did. But to be a member of the church meant that the church would expect you then to tithe on top of that. Yeah. And show up for committee meetings. Right? You have to have committee meetings in a church, but the kingdom of God is never going to break through the ether at a committee meeting. I assure you, it's never going to happen. And so that's the way things were. And then everything suddenly changes. You have the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution, and Thomas Jefferson thinks that you should have religious freedom, and they divide church and state, and suddenly we become what's called a voluntary association. You all volunteered to come here today. Nobody made you. And that's the way we've been. And the church folks thrived in this era. But guess what? So did the Junior League and your Rotary Club and your Kiwanis Club and the Lions Club. Most of us have been informed somewhat by this movement. And it has been wonderful for churches and wonderful for civic organizations. It peaked in about 1965 when church membership in America was at its highest. But it's been going down since the 80s and the 90s. This is, incidentally, the era when White Memorial also thrived. And during this time, folks were convinced that church and church membership were not only good for you as an individual and your family, but it was good for society and it was good for America. And in many places, like the Northeast, this era is completely over. And in other places, like the Southeast, we're in transition. We still see some remnants of that around here, and so do many other churches in our area. And so we're gradually moving toward the complete embrace of what Ted calls in his writing the era of individualization. My guess is you already know this. A person says, well, I don't get anything out of church, but I find God in nature. I'll find God for myself. God speaks to me most clearly in my yoga class or when I'm meditating Things outside of the traditional structure of the church. Folks don't have to come here to volunteer for Habitat anymore. You can just sign up on your own. I could go on and on and on. Spiritual but not religious, anyone? See, in this mindset, folks don't think they have to go to church to help them or others find meaning. And in this mindset, there are an endless number of options for meeting. 
and people explore them. And so in our era, the church is just one of many choices that people can make. And that makes it a challenging and scary time. Ted's larger point for all of us is that the church has survived changes in the past, and it will because of the faithfulness of Christ. Christ, who gets earthy when he becomes a human being, survive the challenges of the future. The challenges, challenges of history are understood by God, and Ted's point is the ancient one and the tried and true one. Jesus, namely that Jesus has been made flesh, and as people are also flesh, and as people who make up the church, that the church can trust Jesus to keep it connected to God in order that we might survive. Will things change around here over the next 5 or 10 or 15 years as we continue to adapt to that age of individualization? Yes, they will. They will. But the core will remain the same. So we will, try to under, we will try to understand the challenges and respond with faithful hearts and faithful lives because we've got a shot to know where we have been. And I think we know where we are. And with Christ's help, we can faithfully discern where we are going. May God bless you all, my friends. And may you remember those important and critical words from the Gospel of John, that no matter how dark things may seem in your own lives, or in our collective life, or maybe when you go home and read the newspaper today, that the darkness comes, but the light shines in that darkness, and the light of God can never be extinguished. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. All people are welcome at this table. All people who are hungry, all people who are thirsty. We all come to it not because we are particularly faithful or good or deserving of this feast, but because we are none of those things. And God welcomes us anyways with open arms. So come, dear ones, the table is set, the meal is prepared. Now, friends, before we share in the Lord's Supper, please know that all are invited to partake of this bread and this cup. All of the bread is gluten-free. You will remain in your seats, and our elders will bring the bread and the cup to you. Once you have been served, hold on to your bread, and we will take that together. And then hold on to your cup, and we will also take that together. Now, as we give thanks for this meal, there will be spoken and sung liturgy, so just listen for the prompts. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Gracious and merciful God, it is indeed right to give you our thanks and our praise. For you alone have created the heavens and the earth. Throughout time you have provided for your people. You gave fruit in the garden to eat and to drink. You gave manna in the wilderness and milk and honey in the promised land. Throughout time you have been faithful to us, creating this world and everything in it, sustaining us through your generous acts of providence. And therefore with all creation we sing your praise.
God, together as a community, we listen to the scripture and we ponder this mystery, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We believe in the mystery that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, teaching us your ways. And when we turned our back on the Word and he was crucified for his teachings, we testify that you raised him from the dead so that all might have eternal life. And in his absence, we believe that you provided the Spirit for us to anoint your disciples with gifts to spread the good news of the gospel and to guide us and encourage us in our faith. This mystery of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is still a mystery beyond all rationality, beyond all comprehension. But this we believe, for indeed great is the mystery of faith. In the Gospels and in the Epistles, we read that on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gathered around the table in the upper room with his disciples, and he broke the bread before them, and he said, This is my body, given for you, so take it and eat it, and do so in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he poured it out before them, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed with my blood, a new covenant, For the forgiveness of sins, drink this and do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of the Lord until he comes again. Amen. The gifts of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
All we like sheep have gone astray, and the bruises of iniquity of us all have been placed upon him. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, who does not weary or grow faint, but calls us to rise up on wings as though we were eagles, that we would run and not be faint. This is the body of Christ given for you. Lord, bid your servant go in peace, for your word is now fulfilled. Human eyes have now seen salvation's dawn in the Christ so long foretold. He is the Savior of the world, the Gentiles' promised light, the glory of God dwelling in our midst, the joy of all peoples. Friends, the cup of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. 
God of resurrection, of words, of flesh, enfleshed. We give you thanks for these humble gifts of bread and cup of this ancient ritual of Eucharist communion. We join in the holy telephone tag of those who came before us. We join and we experience your grace for ourselves. May your bread, your body broken for us, and your cup, your blood poured out for us, be a tangible reminder of your covenant, O God. For God, we have been fed. Help us live into your calling that we might feed others. We thank you, God, for the ways that you are making us new. Help us to see signs of new life all around us in the budding trees and the signs of spring. God, would you help us to tune in to where you are already at work? This morning, we give you thanks for the gift of baptism, of claiming us as your family, leaving no doubt that we belong to you. And thank you, Lord, for new members joining our church this morning. And God, we thank you for the gift of church, this manifestation of the promises of the family of God. May we encourage one another. God, who nourishes us with grace, would you forgive the ways that we are striving and pushing too much? In our striving, we can forget that we are yours. We are your partners. We are your children. We are your disciples, God. Help us to encounter you as you are making all things new. God of resurrection, of Easter hope, Hope that is foolish, that is real, that is fragile. We ask for your strength. Help us to rehearse and replay again and again and again the times that you have been faithful. For you, God, dwell with us even when hope has died. Help us encounter you, O Lord. It is so easy to access the hardships of this world, to see the ravages of war, the hatred, hoarding, disease, natural disasters, ego. God, would you make us instruments of your peace? Would you soften our hearts that we might be ambassadors of reconciliation, of your salvation? wherever we might find ourselves. God, you are making all things new. We pray for those of us who are exhausted, those that are worn down, are hungry, starving, at the edge of burnout, those of us who don't know what the future holds, whose spirits feel like they're hanging on by a thread. In our humanness, these precious bodies that you have given us, flesh, as we are today, would you still innovate in us and with us? Would you still make us new? God, for those of us this morning that are in grief, grief that is so close, the loss so fresh, for those who can barely catch our breath, put one foot in front of the other, God, would you comfort us? Would you send us to be ambassadors of your love and your grace to those in our midst that need your comfort? God, we pray for those of us who are angry, oh, so angry, about the state of our world. Those of us who hunger and who thirst for righteousness and justice, God, you're making all things right, new, right? Quench our thirst, satisfy our hunger, God, you are making all things new. Give us pure hearts so that we can see you. Make us peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Would you transform us? Make us more like your son Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, after hearing such a good word this morning, a good word, this is our time in our service where we get to respond, where we get to practice this living open-handedly in partnership with God, with church, with one another. Let us rehearse our response back to God for all that God has given us. Let us respond by giving generously of our tithes and of our offerings.
Amen. Would you rise in body or spirit as we affirm our faith together using the words that are printed in our bulletin? I ask you, church, what is it that you believe? We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that God has entrusted the church with the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ, that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker, that the church is witness both by word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Um, Eleanor and Gavin, happy baptism day. So proud of both of you. It's a wonderful thing. God bless you both very much. Um, that's fine, yeah. Um, and for those of you that maybe are visiting today, um, we just had everything you can do in a worship service. It, it doesn't happen often. People go, well, why do some services get so busy? And what happens is, is you have to do everything that you want to do before the summer, before Mother's Day, and in between Easter, and everything just gets stacked in on these six to eight weeks. 
Um, so thank you for your patience. I will share that a uh, Chip Pope texted me that the person that had the medical issue was stable when, when, when left here. So we thank God for that blessing as well, too. Um, friends, go into the world. Go into the world to share the love that Christ has given to you freely, knowing that light, God's great gift of life itself, does shine. It shines into all the dark corners and the dark spaces, and even when it's dim, we believe and we trust that it is still there. In the name of God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, may you be blessed until we meet again. And as I start a sabbatical tomorrow, um, I'll see you all um, in the middle of the summer. God bless you.
great job because you know I, I cut out half my prayer and still just the throat not be a prayer. Just keeping us like the music is just I want you to cut out half like, like, prayer. Like after that final Alleluia, I was like, I am just
Thank you both very much. Thank you both so much. You are so welcome. Danita. We did. So in the excitement of taking everything out. Somebody took the tablecloth and put it somewhere. And put somewhere weird. So you'll be copying on the memo that it's somewhere weird and please we have someone remember. It's fine to put an eye on it. Yeah. It was just weird. Somebody will remember. I promise. I mean, it was me, you, Dean, Greg, Rick, Greer. Chip was here. I, I, I focused on the fire of the second was back. Person. We moved them there during, during um, the spring, so 